Wetlands are really unique because they are on the transition between an aquatic environment and a land environment. And so they're at this interface between these two different kind of habitats. And so you have a unique number of species and a unique, um, uniquely adapted species to these special environments. And they are provide not only habitat for aquatic and terrestrial animals and um, fish and crabs and invertebrates and birds. There is an amazing amount of nutrient cycling that goes on in wetlands and nutrients are really important because they're necessary for life but at high levels they can be rather toxic. So nitrogen is a good example. Things that we apply as fertilizers often run off into wetlands and wetlands provide this critical service for us by preventing a lot of the land-based nitrogen from going into aquatic systems. Wetlands have had a long history of human alteration. Direct alterations such as salt hay farming, ditching for mosquito control, and so at this point, when we know the sea level is rising relative to the land surface, um, there's a lot of concern about the state of the wetlands. If you talk to local people, people know that the wetlands are changing and, and they're getting smaller. We're losing the edge of the wetlands. Um, and the type of plants that are in the wetlands are also different from what they were historically. Well, I've noticed the, uh, the encroachment of the, the, uh, the water there's a lot of erosion out on the end of the property here where you can see the, uh, every year you can see a difference in it. And the, uh, the tides itself, uh, they must be running, I'd say a good eight inches higher now than what they used to run. But the creek is definitely shallowed out too. I mean, your tides are running higher, but at the same token, your, your creek is not as deep as it used to be. And uh, there's just a silt filling in and stuff. I don't think there's really gonna be a meadows out there in the future, you know, especially at high tide, it's gonna be 100% under salt water and you can see where it is starting to kill the trees along the edge of the woods there. So I don't know if the woods are going to die off and that's going to become part of the meadows or what Mother Nature really has in store for us here at this point, but there's definitely going to be a change. Right now we're starting this huge assessment effort to really get it handled on not only uh, the state but exactly what is the areas that are most vulnerable and what is the key stressors. The importance of um, the work that's being done by the two national estuary programs, the Barnia Bay Partnership and the Partnership of the Delaware Estuary, as part of the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Wetlands Assessment, or what we refer to as MACWA, is that before we started doing work five years ago, there wasn't really one entity that was doing wetlands monitoring work, wetlands assessment, to really understand what's happening to our coastal wetlands. I So the idea was to be able to take um, EPA's tiered monitoring assessment protocols and really apply them in two systems. Um, the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary started it and then through a combined effort um, and joint funding that we, the Barnegat Bay Partnership, was able to obtain, we were able to bring it over to Barnegat Bay and, and look at the situation with our wetlands as to you know, what's happening to them. So we started doing um, this work. It's very labor intensive. Um, we have a great crew of people that are dedicated to going out and doing the work. We have three locations in Barnegat Bay, one in the northern end up in Reedy Creek, one at Island Beach State Park, and then another location down here off of West Creek. And the idea with the fixed stations, and it's part of our uh, specific intensive monitoring, is to be able to look over a long period of time what are the marshes doing? Are they able to keep pace with sea level rise? Generally, in order to, it, to keep pace, you either have to have a lot of sediment deposition on them or the biomaterial, the things that decompose, helps to build up that mat and the, and the plants are able to keep pace with it. What we feel and what, we've already, what we've, we're starting to see with some of the results is that the marshes in Barnegat Bay are not keeping pace. The other really critical issue too for us is being able to look at the shoreline edge. You know, through using aerial maps and GIS um, over the years, people like Rutgers University have, have looked and said, yes, that in fact, we are losing the edge. And in field applications, we've also seen that we're losing the edge. So now what we're moving towards is 
taking, um, actually going out and measuring how rapidly we're lo losing the edge. And why that's important is because as the edge of the marsh starts to collapse, most of the time it becomes like mud flats it's, and it's not as productive as marsh itself. The other thing is because marshes are a coastal defense for, for humans, as we lose the marsh, we're losing our natural protection against um, storms, nor'easters and hurricanes like we saw with Hurricane Sandy. There's very few pristine marshes as you would find in the Mullica River system. Here, mostly all of them have somehow been manipulated by man. So what we're doing out here is we're looking at the integrity of the marsh. How's the marsh doing? Is it, um, is it keeping up with higher tides and higher sea level? Um, are the plants healthy? Do we have a variety of plants out here versus um, a monoculture? Like if you turn over to your right, where you see a whole patch of Phragmites. And what the Phragmites are the tall ones, generally they indicate when there, where there's been some disturbance. Usually in the Barnegat, it's, it's areas where they've piled dredge spoils and Phragmites don't like to get their feet wet in the salt water very often, so they, they tend to grow on places like that. And we're doing a number of different things out here, not only looking at the biological, but also soil quality, uh, radionucleotides, so we're looking at carbon sequestration and some of the other things that are tied in with sea level rise. And, and then historically, uh, we we're able by taking soil cores and things like that to look at um, different plant stratification and really kind of look at the history of the marsh to give us a pretty good idea of what our marshes are doing and how they're going to react in the future to a changing climate. Uh, another day on the marsh. Hey, that is a good spot. This methodology that we're doing right now is called rapid assessment monitoring. We run four transects, each at a 90 degree angle, um, with the first one going out, Angela's actually going that way, directly out to the bay. And we, we'll take salinity readings, we will also um, dig a hole and take a look at the actual depth of biomass, and then what type of soil is under there, the various soil characteristics, we will we'll note that. Then we'll start to actually do some of the work where we go out to the 25 meter mark and then actually um, take a more in-depth look at the biomass. And what they want to look at is low biomass, then middle biomass, and then higher um, biomass. So the other scientist, researcher, gets down on the ground up close and personal with the marsh and then looking across at the boards, which there are 10 different spots on the board, tells us how many that they can see. Now, they, and that can be part of the board, a little bit of the board, or um, in some cases in a, in a higher marsh where we have higher plants, they can't see any of the board. Then the second test that gets done at the 25 meter mark is now gonna look at how solid the marsh is, the biomass underneath, um, we use a sledgehammer. She'll drop the sledgehammer and we'll see how far down now it goes. So now it's at one centimeter. 1.5 centimeters. 1.75 centimeters. Two. One more. Generally speaking, most of the Barnegat marshes are pretty solid. There are areas, especially along the edges, where we, you can see a, a pretty significant drop when, you, when you're taking this measurement. From our aerial pictures, we can see more than what we're walking around. So we can see if there's larger creeks. We can also see if there's mosquito ditching. In this instance, there's no mosquito ditching that we see from the aerial shots, but this green area is where we, we walk and we look at where the plants are and we do our measurements. But this larger red area we also look at to see if there's any um, human impacts, if there's roads 
or houses, if there's mosquito ditching, if there's any kind of barriers to the water moving where it should be. The other thing that's important about that is to look at if the marsh needs to retreat inward, um, in other words, because of sea level rise, is there a place for the marsh to go? And in a lot of situations here in the Barnegat, there really isn't because what you're running up against too is humans, houses, bulkheads, those kind of things. Future considerations when we talk about if restoring the marshes, we may not have the ability to store, restore inward, we may have to try to restore what's out here now. One of the services that wetlands provides, in addition to its intrinsic habitat value and value for nutrient cycling and processing and carbon storage, is the value of these as a buffer uh, to dissipate wave energy and tidal energy during storm surges. And it really helps you know, coastal areas that are developed uh, behind wetlands to reduce the, the negative impacts of flooding and storm surges. So uh, it, it is extremely important to uh, try to maintain your wetland acreage and area as well as function. The real importance of the work that we're doing, um, besides just learning really what's going on with the wetlands, is to be able to, uh, to help resource managers develop better policies on how we can protect and restore our wetlands. You know, in some cases, some wetlands we won't be able to do anything about because it'll just be too costly. And the amount of engineering that would need to be done in order to, to have the wetlands keep pace just isn't financially possible. But in other areas, um, we will be able to do such applications, do living shorelines projects, hopefully get to the point where the state allows for beneficial use of dredge materials so that we can supplement the marsh and allow the marsh to continue to keep pace with our rising tides here in, in the bay. You definitely want to maintain the natural habitats like sand dunes and also wetlands between you and your property because those are very valuable and I think, you know, with the increased storm frequency and intensity that's predicted for this area, that's, those are things that we definitely want to do. It's really being mindful of how important wetlands are, being stewards of the wetland. For example, homeowners who live on and near the water, making sure that they're kind of securing all of their loose things that could get into the water, you know, gas t tanks, uh, above ground storage tanks, those kind of things that they're secure so that those types of things don't end up in the marsh. If you like to ride your PWC, really staying out of the wetlands. In a lot of cases, we can see where the, the marshes are actually collapsing from the amount of boat wakes. So really kind of being mindful of that and not entering into those areas is incredibly important. You know, we're all stewards of the bay, and it's really important that we all kind of do our part. Maybe it's just little, but it's, in the end it adds up. And uh, if we want to keep our home the way it is, we should you know, really you know, work towards collectively trying to protect it.